If you ask me what drives my thinking on development, I have to say it is inclusion. I have to admit that I'm obsessed with inclusion. Inclusion is a simple but yet powerful concept. Morally right and economically smart. Let me explain when economy grows without being inclusive. To start with, the benefit of growth and rising income are not evenly distributed. But there is more to it. I believe exclusive, exclusive growth is really like a poison. It is deadly, but kills slowly. Failure is only a matter of when and how, not if. Growth without inclusion is harmful. It damages the social fabrics, it destroys the trust of the leadership, and even wear down society because there is no commitment from the community. And I've seen that my first, first hand in my own countries, Indonesia. Back in 1980s, 1990, Indonesia was a poster child for developing country. We grew at a very robust and impressive rate, up to 9% per annum. Even the poverty went down. But the problem at that time, our president, President Suharto, was ruling the country in the authoritarian way. We have parliament, but there, is no really, there was no really check and balances. There is no transparency, there is no accountability. Suharto's main interest is actually the well-being of his family and a few friends who control almost the economy. So while the West, including the bank, at that time, applauded him for his economic performance, the country actually rife with corruption, chronism, nepotism, and dominated by a climate of fear. So we had enough. The financial crisis in 1998 has created or triggered the national-wide student movement. We call it the Reformacy Movement. I was actually teaching at the University of Indonesia, and I joined the student demanding a change. We protested until Suharto resigned. So when the Arab Spring came to Middle East in 2010, I saw the history of Indonesia repeating itself. The poison of exclusion finally bring the society to the tipping point. So what are the symptoms of this exclusion poison? If you ever live in the society full with exclusion, you can easily explain. You know that no matter how hard you try to improve your life, you will not get the job that you are qualified for only because you don't have a good connection or the right connection. And if you start business, you cannot get a good contract because you are not paying bribe. And the elite, the few elite, powerful elite, they are only interested 
in protecting their each other vested interests. And if you are coming from the poor family, it is likely that you will stay poor. These are all the description how damaging the exclusion poison is. To change the society from the non-transparent, non-participatory into an open, fair, and inclusive is really a major undertaking. But it is worth it. Today, we know so much about the inclusion which is matter, and there is a lot of evidence. Take, for example, gender. In many countries, both developing countries or even high-income countries, girls and women are still constrained and subjected to so many constraints because of the rule, the law, the policy, or even the norm. They are excluded from the decision-making process in their own family or even in the society. And the cost of keeping girls and women behind are stifling. If women cannot work, or in this case, cannot even have their own business, it can cause up to 25% income loss in Middle East. And here in Latin America, it can cost up to 14%. On the other side, the benefit of including girls and women are so obvious. I will give you an example. When girls stay another year in a secondary school, their income is going to be 25% higher. And if a mother has the right to inherit the family property, they will likely to spend twice as much for their daughter education. So you can see the benefit is not only for that mother, but for the next generation. And companies, when they have women in their leadership, they are less likely to be embroiled in fraud and scandal. So let me ask you, which country in the world can afford to forego this social and economic benefit? And this is also true for many different other societies that are marginalized because of their ethnicity, their tribe, their nationality, or even their religion. You see that my experience in my own country of exclusion has left an indelible mark on the way I think about development. I think this is my mother's fault. My mother had 10 children, six girls and four boys. I'm number seven. <laughs> number seven is like a donkey, actually. <laughs> she was not only a very lovable and devoted mother and wife, but she had PhD in education, and she was a very successful working woman. She insisted on all of us to get a good education, boys and girls. And she, the most important, is helping all of us to navigate the Indonesian strict gender norm. So when you grow up like me, in which your family encourage you to do well, and defying stereotype, you will be easily get suspicious of people who justify 
discrimination and exclusion. And you know, based on the evidence, that a country which is applying exclusion, they will keep poor, or they are becoming poorer. While inclusion is always a benefit and never a cost. I think we all need to remember this in everything we do. Be a student, a next leader, or a, as a policy maker, and as a poverty fighter. Thank you very much. Thank you.